There we go. Um, uh, sorry, now that I'm recording, of course, this is Matt Hedrick from Brandeis. Um, he'll be uh, talking here in day two about holographic entropy inequalities. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Matt. All right, thank you. Um, and um, I welcome interruptions for questions or comments or corrections or, or whatever, so don't be shy. Um, so yeah, the talk today, my talk today is about holographic entropy inequalities. Um, so for those of you who have heard me talk in the last few years, you might be pleasantly surprised that this talk will be almost bit thread free. Um, so that's a novelty. Um, I, I decided to aim it mostly for um, people not who don't spend their every waking minute thinking about Ryu Takenagi formula like like I do. Um, uh, more for people in the in the other community. Um, uh, but there will be at the end something new. Um, uh, so most of it will be sort of overview and review of state of the art and so on. But then at the end, there'll be a, a, a new development and some work in progress. So um, so the outline. So I mean, I guess I, I should also you know apologize for the um, my scrawl. Um, uh, but I decided that was the best way to kind of be able to draw and write whatever I wanted as opposed to trying to make nice slides. I'm, I'm put to shame a little bit by Peter and Netta's beautiful um, uh, presentations yesterday. So this is a little bit more Blackboard talk style. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and, and I think Netta already set up a lot of the very basics. Um, so I'll, of course, do a, you know, real, just very short, you can see the whole thing, a very short thing on holography um, and RT. And I'm assuming that's not new to anybody in the audience, but maybe if if there's somebody from, you know, not from this field, that this is maybe an opportunity. To, if if there is some nagging question or 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 something um, something that's not clear, you know, when you hear talks about this, you know, this would be a good time to to stop um, and try to get some clarity. Um, uh, and um, uh, so then the main focus of the talk is going to be about uh, inequalities that are satisfied by the RT formula. Um, and uh, and then so then we're going to switch and talk about the HRT formula for so the difference with between RT and HRT is not just the presence of H, um, but um, the fact that the HRT formula is um, refers to time dependent situations so it's more general, um, and then uh, that's where things start getting messy in terms of understanding entropy inequalities. Um, and you start to need some actual GR as opposed to some, you know, very, very basic kind of geometry. Um, uh, and so it's more interesting. And um, there's been a open question for a number of years now about whether um, some of the uh, inequalities that are known to be obeyed by the RT formula are also obeyed by the HRT formula. Um, and so the new thing that I'll talk about at the very end of this talk is we have in, in, in work in progress with um, uh, Guillermo Grimaldi and Veronica Hubini, um, uh, a, a, a proof um, that indeed all of the RT entropy inequalities are obeyed by the HRT formula. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, holography, you've seen this picture a million times, um, but just to orient you in how I'm going to be drawing these pictures, and again, you know, feel free to, to stop me um, uh, if there's, you know, something bugging you about this, but we have the usual soup can picture where the um, the interior of the soup can is governed by a quantum gravity theory, and we're working in a limit where that's well approximated by classical general relativity with some matter fields, and that's in the bulk. And I'll use the notation that little d plus one is the space-time dimension of the bulk. Um, uh, and um, uh, that's a general relativity theory with a negative cosmological constant and a negative cosmological constant would normally cause the universe to big crunch, as opposed to the positive cosmological constant we have in our universe, which causes an accelerated expansion. And to prevent that big crunch, you just, like a drum, you just nail the drum head uh, um, on, on a ring, on a, on a boundary stretched out, and that, um, uh, that prevents this basically elastic medium from, from contracting. Um, and so that boundary condition is the ADS uh, boundary condition that you specify here. And um, uh, and this quantum gravity theory is dual to uh, a, a conformal field theory, which is living on this boundary space time, which is only d dimensions. Um, and important facts about that uh, conformal field theory are that 
uh, first of all, it's it's a large n theory, meaning it has a large number of degrees of freedom, and it's a it's a strongly coupled field theory. Okay, so that's kind of all I'm really going to need to know about holography for this talk. Um, and then we have the also very famous by now um, uh, Ryu Takanagi formula, um, which ref which makes the assumption. So it makes a bunch of assumptions. Um, one assumption is that, as I said, we're working in a limit where the where the bulk is dis well described by classical GR. Uh, Netta's talk emphasized the importance of the quantum corrections. In this talk, I'm not going to really be focusing on the quantum corrections, but they are, to some extent, understood. So it's not um, uh, it's not that we know nothing about them. Um, but another restriction for this formula is that it, re it refers to a static state. Actually, you can be a little bit more general. You can have a a state which has a time reflection symmetry. Um, but let's, for simplicity, let's just say it's static. Um, and so we, we have a, a notion, even though in usual, usually in general relativity, there's no you know, canonical notion of a time coordinate. We have a you know, time reparameterization symmetry. Um, if, if the thing is static, uh, then you do have a well-defined notion of a time. Uh, you, you do have a canonical choice of a time coordinate. And so we can talk about a time slice. Um, so a time slice is just you know, one of these slices here. Um, and so for this talk, part of the talk, we're just focusing in on uh, a time slice. Any time slice is as good as another. And we're interested in, so this is my picture of the time slice here. And um, we're interested in um, the entropy of a given boundary region, spatial boundary region on that slice. So in this sense, not only am I making an assumption about the state being static, but also that the region I'm interested in uh, lies on a constant time slice. Um, and then um, you look for the minimal surface, which is in the correct homology class. The homology class is the one which is uh, homologous to the given boundary region. And what that means is that there's a bulk region um, uh, in, that interpolates between um, the given boundary region and the minimal surface. Um, and that, among other things, forces the minimal surface to be anchored on the entangling surface, which is the boundary of the region A, if there is one. Although in other circumstances, for example, if we have a, if we have a, like a two-sided black hole or a multi-boundary wormhole and, and the region A is an entire boundary, then there would be no entangling surface, so there's no anchoring condition, but there's still the homology condition. And, um, and then, of course, in the box is the very famous formula. I will use absolute values. OK, so first of all, I should say I'll use gamma of A to denote the minimal surface. And then I'll use absolute values to, to, to denote the area, just because we're going to have so many areas flying around in this talk that it would just clutter things up too much if I actually wrote the word area every time. Um, and uh, this is in units of basically the, bl the bulk Planck length. Um, and in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna, because I'm not actually considering the expansion in powers of that, um, uh, I'm only gonna be considering the classical part, this leading part, I'm just gonna set this to one in the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so that, uh, a few comments. Um, so first of all, uh, if there is an entangling surface, then the um, minimal surface is, um, uh, is, is anchored on the entangling surface, uh, which is actually infinitely far away, and that leads to a divergent area. So the right-hand side here is, is divergent, and that's appropriate because the entropy also has a divergence, which from a boundary CFT viewpoint is an ultraviolet divergence. And you can check that the, that, that the coefficient of the divergence is correct for a given field theory. Um, uh, by the way, it, it, you know, this is, of course, a curved, um, a manifold um, and it's asymptotically hyperbolic. And so that means that um, the, the minimal surface hangs into the bulk just in trying to minimize its area. It's, it has a smaller area if it, goes, if it goes deeper into the bulk. And that's why it sort of has a shape that might look like this. Um, as I said, this is an expansion in powers of, of, um, uh, of this coefficient where the leading term is one over that coefficient. Um, and the bulk plank, so this is, this is a, the, the bulk Planck length to the d minus one is the bulk Planck area, which in bulk, you know, in terms of the bulk constants that a bulk physicist would measure is Newton's constant times h bar, which in any number of dimensions has units of area. Um, and um, uh, again, this is one over the number of degrees of freedom. So that's our 
um, small parameter here. Um, so on the bulk side, that's measuring how classical or weakly coupled the gravity side is. And it, on the boundary, that's measuring how many, one over the number of fields we have. So one over the central charge or one over the N squared, if, you know, if it's a large N uh, gauge theory. Okay, and the, the, you know, as Netta emphasized yesterday, the, um, uh, the, the, this homology region plays a key role. That's the region that is reconstructable um, from operators uh, on, uh, the, on the region A, and Netta's talk was devoted to making that more, well, dealt quite a bit with making that more precise, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into that. In fact, I'm not going to use that at all in this talk, but I thought I should mention. And, and so um, this is also also goes by the name entanglement wedge. And you might say, well, this doesn't look much like a wedge. Um, why is it called a wedge? Well, it's called a wedge because actually the entanglement wedge is the causal development of this thing. And so if you look at it from the side, um, if this is my, um, let me attempt to 3D drawing in real time here. So I have some bulk region A. Uh, sorry, some boundary region A, and um, uh, here's my uh, minimal surface, and then the causal development of little r is actually a wedge, um, and that thing is the entanglement wedge. So strictly speaking, the term entanglement wedge refers to a bulk space-time region, uh, but um, when there isn't uh, the chance of getting confused, people often just use uh, it to refer to the bulk spatial region, which is this homology region. Okay. Um, okay, that, that's the quick background. Are there any are there any questions before I jump into more substantive things? Okay. Um, so entropy inequalities. Um, so it's known, of course, that von Neumann entropies obey some inequalities, such as subadditivity and strong subadditivity. And um, uh, and so this formula should match those, and, and it does. Um, uh, and then it kind of overachieves because it, 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 it obeys more inequalities that are actually not properties of, um, of von Neumann entropy for general quantum system. Okay, and, and I'm gonna go through these proofs because the, the whole rest of the talk is gonna be um, uh, like looking at these proofs from, from different angles. And in particular, asking what happens to these proofs when we add the time direction. Okay, so subadditivity is is very simple. And by the way, I should add that I, um, in this talk, you know, to hopefully make it more followable, I'm sweeping a lot of technical details under the rug. Um, so you, you could question, you know, how rigorous these proofs are, and we can definitely talk about that. And basically, the the short version is that this the the proofs for the static case for RT, which is the first part of this talk they can be made as rigorous as you want. Um, uh, the proofs for the um, uh, covariant case, the HRT formula, can probably also be made rigorous if one worked hard enough at it. But as physicists, we haven't you know, quite done that. But there's, you know, so trying to make those sort of more careful requires quite a bit of work that I'm not going to get into at all. Um, uh, OK, so anyway, so subadditivity is your simplest entropy and equality, aside, I guess, from just the positivity of, of entropy. Um, uh, and um, uh, what's the logic here? Well, what you do is you, you want to show, um, you, you have an inequality which says that S of AB is less than, less than or equal to something. S, S of AB is given by a minimization. And so if, if you can simply find a, um, a representative of the class of things that are being minimized over, um, uh, whose area equals the right-hand side, you're done. Because uh, by definition, S of AB is, is the minimum within that class. And indeed, we can. So what all you do is you take the minimal surface for, for A and the minimal surface for B and take their union. Um, and that's a surface which is homologous to AB via this. You just union the um, homology region for A and the homology region for B. And that's a candidate surface for AB. I'm not saying that's the minimal surface for AB, but I'm just saying it's in the right homology class. So it's in the class of things that are being minimized over. So you know for sure that the actual minimal surface has an area which is not larger than that of um, this candidate, and that's your inequality. Okay, so this the strategy is not going to change for the entire 
talk. It's always going to be like that. You look at the left-hand side when it's written as something less than or equal to something else. You look at the left-hand side and you attempt to find a surface um, whose area you know uh, in terms of the right-hand side um, and which is a candidate among the things that you um, are minimizing on. Okay, so the next hardest one is strong additivity. Um, uh, and um, again, what we're going to do is we're going to look now. So now we have two terms on the left hand side. So we're going to look for a surface, which is a candidate surface for B and a candidate surface for ABC. And suppose that your boundary regions are arranged. And I just did this to sort of make the proof look nice. It doesn't, you know, it have to be like this. But suppose that A, B, and C are sort of right next to each other, adjoining each other. So when you, so you have an AB minimal surface, which is something like this, and you have a BC minimal surface, which is something like this, and then you want to find a candidate minimal surface for B. Uh, so you can do that just by dividing the AB minimal surface into the part which is, um, uh, the part which is inside the BC homology region and the part which is outside the BC homology region. So I've divided this surface into these two parts, this part and this part, and similarly I can divide the BC surface into this part and this part. So now I have four surfaces and I reconnect them. So I get a surface which is homologous to B and a surface which is homologous to ABC. And then the proof goes through the exact same way. Okay. Um, so um, uh, you can keep playing this game. Um, so there's a, there's a stronger inequality that is obeyed for, again, for three regions, which is goes by the rather obscure name MMI. Don't worry about what that stands for, um, uh, and which looks like this, or it can be written in terms of mutual information like this. So it's a kind of super additivity of mutual information. Um, and the proof is the same way, and I'm not going to go through it, but you you just look, you, you, you cut up the minimal surface for these guys, each one into four subsurfaces. You reassemble them into groups of three, which are candidates for candidate surfaces for A, B, C, and A, B, C. And then you have your inequality. Um, so this is an interesting inequality. So first of all, I should say that, you know, that, I mean, historically, um, and I guess logically, this, this strong subadditivity is, th this proof of strong subadditivity is important because it shows that the Ryutaki-Nagi formula is, is on the right track. Or early on, it was one of the first, you know, um, pieces of evidence that it wasn't completely insane formula. Um, uh, now, MMI is not like that because this inequality is not true for general um, quantum states. It's very easy to find counterexamples. Um, uh, and so in that sense, it distinguishes holographic states from more general quantum states. Um, uh, for those in the know, there's an infinite set of constrained inequalities for von Neumann entropy uh, that were written down by Cadney, Linden, and Winter. And um, uh, this inequality implies them all. So that's another check. Um, and uh, when I say that it distinguishes holographic from general quantum states, it's very important here that I am working in the classical limits. So um, the quantum corrections uh, do not, in general, you know, they don't follow along the same logic. Um, and therefore, um, while taking into account the quantum corrections as Netta did yesterday, you will certainly still, you better still obey strong subadditivity if, if, if holography is correct. You need not, in general, obey MMI, uh, and you don't. So, um, uh, so more to the point, since, since, the end, since the RT formula is giving you the leading term in an expansion, if your expansion is well controlled, the issue of the subleading terms only arises if this inequality happens to be saturated at leading order. So you can find configurations where this inequality is, is saturated at leading order. And then in those configurations, the inequality is not necessarily obeyed at subleading order. Um, so, okay. Sorry, does that mean there are examples where it's just not obeyed or we don't have uh, arguments that it should be obeyed? No, it's not obeyed. It's not obeyed, so in um, it, it's only obeyed by the leading term. Yeah. Um, Sorry, not, Matt. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick basic thing, but given what you said, then uh, with the whether a CFT obeys or doesn't obey MMI, then could be like a basic first diagnostic for whether it has a holographic dual, right? Right. 
Okay, and if maybe we find more of these types of properties, I guess we can narrow it down even more semi-classically. Right. Okay, cool. Right. Although, um, so th this is so it, it's it's a one-directional test in the sense that um, I think there are large n or large CCFTs that obey it that are not holographic in the sense of I mean th this is when you start getting to an argument about what you know what is holographic and what is not holographic so uh, but in the sense in the in the very narrow sense of having like a a bulk dual that is well described at general relativity um uh i think that's that's too strong that so that doesn't imply in my mind but i don't think it goes the other way i think there are theories that are more general than that that do that still obey mmi um but it's a it is a it is a diagnostic yeah you mean some notion like strong coupling is not required I think that strong coupling is not required. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, Actually, uh, Matt, I'm confused by your answer. Why, why is strong coupling not required? If, you, if you're doing something which is essentially classical string theory, it's not clear that these inequalities hold, right? I, I, think, it, I think they probably do, although, I mean, this is just my opinion. Um, uh, and... Um, you know, there, there are a few ways to, 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 to sort of argue that. So, I mean, one is that, um, uh, if, if you, first of all, if you look at stringing corrections, uh, for which we have formulas, um, those, uh, do not violate MMI. So basically the structure of the way that you calculate the, um, the entropies in that case is structurally similar enough that MMI still holds. Um, now that's a perturbative argument. And you could say, well, now if I look at, you know, at finite coupling, do I know that it, that it still holds? And I don't, I, I don't know for a fact that it still holds, but there are cases where I know that it still holds. For example, in, in, in any large CCFT with where the, the monogamy calculation of the entropies is valid, the entropy, so, you know, that's a way of calculating the ground state entropies in uh, large CCFT. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you'll, you'll get the same entropies as RT and therefore it will obey MMI. So th that makes me think that probably this is uh, really more a reflection of the classicality than the, um, uh, than the locality of the bulk. Uh, but, but again, this is sort of my opinion. So, so, so you would actually say that if you took the three symmetric orifold, MMI yeah, I would think it hold? does. I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at least, at least those. I mean, the simplest symmetric orbifolds um, where the the monogamy method applies, it it, it will yeah. hold. Just yeah. at the just at the three orbifold point. Yeah. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those are, yeah, th I think that those are interesting questions that have not, you know, been adequately um, explored, um, so. Can someone calculate, like, in large N, N equals four super Yang mills, whether MMI is satisfied? I, I don't, like, in free, free uh, N equals four, you mean, or something like yeah, that? I mean, it sounds like you're saying it would depend on large N, but would be independent of right. the coupling yeah it, it, it it's very very hard to calculate that you know for a general region um uh so i mean tadashi and friends have calculated it for simple things like half space and stuff but here you you would want to calculate it for sort of a general region and i don't think that's been done i i wouldn't start there i with this question i would start with the 2d large ccfts personally Um, Matt, mm -hmm. um, for the case where a CFT does not uh, violate MMI, but may also not emit a classical holographic dual, um, do you expect some higher party inequality, uh, uh, holographic inequality to be violated? Or is, do you think there is a possibility where it satisfies all higher party holographic inequalities and still does not emit? a uh, classical holographic. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I'll, I'm about to talk about the higher party inequalities for those who are, don't know what Temple is talking about. Um, uh, um, but the, the, the point there is that the proof method 
you know, it is the, absolutely the same for all of them. So I, I don't see any reason why one of the higher party inequalities would be sensitive in a way that MMI is not sensitive. Um, you know, so I, I would be very surprised, but, you know, maybe there's something going on there that I, you know, haven't thought enough about or something. Um, yeah. So, um, right. So the higher entropy inequalities. Um, so um, a while ago, um, uh, it was discovered that MMI is not the last entropy inequality. Um, uh, there, there are higher ones. And in fact, there's an infinite number of them. So here, I've only written one, which is um, a five-party inequality. Um, so it's you have A, B, C, D, and E. And on the left-hand side, um, you have these sort of two-party entropies plus a five-party entropy. On the right-hand side, you have three-party entropies. And it has this dihedral symmetry. And like, like MMI, it is not. So first of all, I should say it's independent. You might, what, you might wonder whether it's a consequence of MMI and the other ones, but it, it's not. You can show that it's it's independent. Um, it, like MMI, it is not valid for general quantum states. It is proved the same way. Um, and there's some, um, you know, there's an infinite list that are known, and there's sort of a general proof, you know, almost algorithmic proof method um, uh, for finding new ones. So, for example, the MMI and the five-party one are members of a um, an infinite sequence of inequalities for odd, any odd number of parties that kind of look, look, look very similar. I mean, you could just guess their form. Um, uh, but then there's many others. Th those are not the only, that's not the only family of inequalities. Um, and there are more and more and more as you get, as you add more and more parties. Okay. Um, uh, so um, uh, one way to think about these inequalities is uh, that they define a cone. Um, so what's called the, the, the holographic entropy cone. So um, where should I scroll to? Okay, so uh, for example, if you're just looking at two parties, then you only have three entropies, S of A, S of B, and S of AB. Um, and uh, within that space, uh, so that's a three-dimensional um, uh, set of uh, um, orthant in, in R3, um, a positive orthant since the entropies all have to be positive, but with but not every not every entropy vector within this space is allowed by subadditivity. So subadditivity is the only subadditivity plus um, uh, the um, uh, Araki Lieb inequality are the only ones for two parties. And so they, those carve out this um, th this solid, cone in, um, uh, in this entropy vector space. So in general, for n parties, you look at all of the inequalities for m less than or equal to n parties. Um, and you have a 2n minus 1 dimensional space of possible entropy vectors. Um, uh, the minus 1 is because, so the 2 to the n is because it's the power set on your uh, set of parties. And the minus 1 is because the empty set it, does not have an interesting uh, entropy. Um, and what you can show is that the, the holographic entropy cone for n parties is always a convex polyhedral cone. Uh, for n equals two, it's the same as the quantum entropy cone. That is the, the set of entropy vectors that are possible for any quantum system. But for n more than two, when MMI kicks in, um, it's strictly smaller, than, it's strictly contained within the n party quantum entropy cone. Um, and each inequality defines a face of this cone. Um, uh, and um, th actually, it's interesting that you can talk about this cone without talking at all about um, holography or even um, or entropy or even manifolds. Even though the, the, the entropies in RT are defined by minimal surfaces, you, you can just as well sort of think about it as just min cuts on a graph, which is a rather well studied you know, subject in graph theory, yet surprisingly, um, the, so you could certainly define what you would call the min cut cone um, for a graph with n plus one terminals. So your n plus one terminals would be the n regions, A, B, C, D, E, plus one extra, which would be the purifier. Um, but surprisingly, it, it doesn't seem that graph theorists have done too much work on understanding the general um, structure of the min cut cone. 
Um, uh, so, um, so basically, you know, string theorists had to like figure this out and are still trying to figure it out. Um, like I said, the inequalities define faces of the cone, but since it is a polyhedral convex cone, you can equally well describe it in terms of the extreme rays, the edges, the lowest dimensional edges of the, um, the, the one dimensional edges of the cone. Um, and you can write down explicitly what those are for low enough n. So for n equals one and two, it's simply made of Bell pairs, by which I mean that, you know, a given extreme ray is an entropy vector. And um, it's the entropies of that entropy vector are that of a Bell pair. Um, for example, this, this extreme ray down here, which has S of AB equals zero, is a Bell pair shared between A and B. And this ray, which has S of B equals zero, is a Bell pair shared between A and the, and the purifier. Um, uh, for n equals three and four, um, uh, you have to add in four party perfect tensors. Uh, for n equals three, you have to add in four party perfect tensors. And for n equals four, you have to add in six party perfect tensors with two of the parties joined. Um, and that's the complete list. For n equals five, it was open for a while what the complete list is, but then Sergio um, Cuenca uh, wrote it down and it's a rather long and complicated list. I mean, it's, I think there's 19 different topological types of um, of extreme rays, and for n greater than five, it's still unknown. And there's no systematic procedure for, aside from just brute force, uh, given that. So you, you you have basically a systematic procedure for finding all the inequalities for a given n, and then if you want to find the extreme rays, there's you know you just would have to brute force it based on that list of inequalities. So no kind of like beautiful structure, let me put it that way, has emerged saying oh the the entropy vector for you know, any number of parties is defined by these extreme rays, which you kind of write down in some, you know, simple way or something like that. So it, it, it's not clear what mathematical structure is, is behind here. And going along with that, it's sort of not, um, not really clear to what extent, um, uh, what, what, what the physical meaning of these uh, inequalities is. So, so as I said before, the, the existence of, of MMI and the higher inequalities shows that at least the static um, holographic states uh, have a special multi-party entanglement structure. But we don't really know how to say what that structure is aside from simply writing down the inequalities. Um, now, for the case of n equals three, which I said is the first non-trivial one, um, in a paper I wrote with um, uh, uh, Patrick Hayden, um, Temple Hay, uh, Bogdan Stoika, Sean Tsui, um, and um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Temple is there, so you can tell me if I forgot somebody. Um, I think Michael Walter. And Michael Walter, thank you. Um, uh, we, we made a conjecture for that, um, for, for the nature of the state which, which explains MMI, and, and it was very simple, and it was sort of based partly on, on bit threads. One thing I didn't say, I said this talk would be almost bit thread free. So, oh, by the way, oh, um, these inequalities up to MMI, stopping here, we know bit thread based proofs where you, you don't talk about minimal surfaces at all. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, uh, starting, starting in the five party dihedral inequality and for the higher ones, we don't know how to use bit threads to prove those. Um, so anyway, based partly on the, on the, on the bit threads, or let's, let's just say inspired by the bit threads, we, we conjectured that the three party states are basically given by bell pairs and four party perfect tensors. Um, up to quantum correction. So you, you definitely have to include the quantum corrections or the statement is, is manifestly false. Um, and, and, and the nature of those quantum corrections, if the conjecture is true, are, um, uh, is unclear, but they certainly play an important role because otherwise you can very easily falsify this conjecture. Now, many people um, in the field faced with this conjecture seem to immediately think it's obviously wrong. Um, uh, and proceed to give a lot of arguments why, why it's wrong. And um, uh, um, probably the, the, the tightest argument so far given was by Chris Akers and Pratik Raf, which is um, uh, still not watertight. Um, so the situation is not completely clear. So I, I would say we don't, we don't absolutely know for sure that the conjecture is false, on the other hand, and I can say this as an author of the conjecture, there really isn't all that much evidence in favor of the conjecture either. 
Um, so if you were tend to be skeptical, you would you're certainly within your rights to to think it's probably false um, without you know without offending me. Um, uh, so um, uh, so it would be nice to understand what's going on with these inequalities, um, whether they what what they mean in terms of the the entanglement structure of these states. And I think one question which is relevant to that is uh, whether the uh, inequalities are valid when we release the static um, restriction. Um, and so that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Uh, but are there any questions here? Okay. Um, so, so the punchline is, is that um, the answer to that question in red is going to be no. But first, we have to talk about how we um, uh, how we compute entropies uh, if we're not assuming um, staticness. Staticness, recall, allowed us to work on a constant time slice, um, and so that that's where like the technical you know meat of this talk is going to be. Okay, so then we upgrade ourselves to the um, HRT entropy formula. So that's so RT, of course, is Ryu Takenagi. HRT is Hubini Rangamani Takenagi. So it's not the same R, by the way. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so now we're in a space time. Um, and in a space time, presumably, we're still looking for a surface whose area is going to be the entropy. Um, so the surface would presumably still be a space like now co-dimension 2 in space time surface. Um, uh, but the thing is, we have to drop the minimality assumption because for a space like uh, co-dimension two surface um, in a Lorentzian space time, you can always wiggle it up and down in the time direction to decrease the area. So there's no, there's no notion of a minimal space-like surface. So we have to replace it with something and what HRT replaced it with is extremal, which is to say it extremizes the area. Netta talked about this a lot yesterday. Um, and as she said, if there's multiple once you choose the minimal extremal um, uh, surface. Okay, so it extremizes the area against um, uh, variations in the time direction and against variations in the space direction. So for example, if as in this cartoon, we're in the bulk is two plus one dimensional, then gamma would simply be a, a space like geodesic. Okay, and then how do you prove entropy inequalities? Well, um, okay, so the first thing to say is that when you talk about entropy inequalities here, your, your regions are going to be parties of a, of a joint quantum state. And therefore, they, as, as regions of the boundary, spatial regions of the boundary, they have to lie on a common time slice. Um, so there has to be some time. That, that doesn't mean, you know, so in some coordinate system, they'll be at the same time. That's not a covariant statement. But they, they cannot be time-like related to each other, because then it doesn't make sense to talk about their union or something, the entropy of AB if A and B are, are, are time-like related to each other. Okay, so there was going to be a boundary coach, a boundary time slice, which I'll call capital sigma. Okay, so let's do subadditivity. And this one turns out to be pretty easy, at least if you don't worry too much about being rigorous, um, which I won't. Um, so uh, again, we're looking for some gamma tilde, and we can just do the same thing we did before. We can um, uh, we can take whatever the HRT surface, the extremal surface was for A, and union it with the extremal sur surface for B. Um, and here I realized that I, I left one thing out. So the homology condition um, in this, uh, this space-time setting is now that um, there exists a time slice, a bulk time slice. So here um, uh, on some bulk time slice. So there, there exists a bulk time slice uh, on which gamma of A is homologous to A. So anyway, so um, uh, so now I take the union, and that's still going to be homologous, because I have this homology region union, this homology region. And uh, so it's a candidate. So it's it, the point is, since gamma of A is extremal and gamma of B is extremal, their union is extremal. And therefore, it's a candidate. When I look for the minimal extremal uh, surface for AB, uh, this one is in that list of things I'm looking at, and so I get the inequality I had before. Okay, so that's an easy one. Didn't require too much um, creativity. Uh, things are not so good when you get to strong subadditivity um, and higher ones. Okay, so you might naively try to do the same thing, but you've got a couple of problems immediately. Uh, the first problem 
is that your um, gamma of AB and your gamma of BC need not actually even cross. They need not lie on a common slice, time slice. So they may, they may simply miss each other. Um, it's easy to construct examples where that happens. Even if they do happen to sit on a common slice, uh, you're not out of the woods because these uh, candidate surfaces you make for B and for ABC, uh, guess what? They're not extremal. Um, and so they're not on the list of things that you were um, uh, ex that you were minimizing amongst. Okay? Um, so this proof method, the, the naive proof method, simply falls on its face. Um, uh, but luckily, uh, it was, the situation was saved by Aaron Wall, who came up with the maximum formulation of the HRT um, formula. And you know, the, the, the hard part of what Aaron did is to show, so I'm going to give a very quick argument that it's um, equivalent to HRT, uh, but making that argument careful is very, is technically very challenging. Once you have the maximum formula, as I'll show you, the rest of the proof goes through very easily. Um, okay, so what we do is we say, well, I know that my extremal surface is, as I said before, extremized against both time-like and space-like variations. So let me just separate those two and um, talk about variations in, the, in a spatial direction um, uh, as being on some given slice, time slice. And then variations in the time direction as being um, variations of the time slice. So I now have a, a bulk time slice, which I want to be anchored on my boundary time slice. So that's little sigma. And I'm going to maximize among those. Um, within that slice, I'm going to look for a surface um, that is homologous, um, a bulk surface homologous to A. So this part of the formula, it's just like I'm doing RT. Um, but on that uh, bulk uh, slice sigma, okay? And then you can convince yourself pretty easily that that, that gives you an extremal surface be, for the reason I gave, that you're, you're, you're extremal against variation both in the time and space directions. It, it doesn't, that alone does not show you that it is the minimal extremal surface, and that requires a little, um, well, that, that's the hard part. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through that argument, but but this is where you're really actually talking about gravity. So you, you see an interesting thing about all of the RT arguments I gave is that you need to know almost nothing about, um, you know, holography, gravity, or anything. You're just doing minimal surfaces on some Riemannian manifold with boundary. So it's kind of weird. It's like on an almost physics-free um, uh, set of theorems, which is a little weird. But um, so you might be comforted to know that uh, in the in in the in the HRT setting, we really need to know some physics. We need we need to impose some. In particular, we need to impose this energy condition, the null energy condition, which is imposed in you know almost any kind of classical GR theorem. Um, and it basically says that gravity focuses light rays. Okay, when you have gravitational lensing, the the, the light rays never diverge because of some mass; they always converge. Okay. Um, so, but let me just proceed, assuming this formula here. Um, and um, uh, here's the here's the strategy. So um, uh, we we pick a time slice. We're going to work on a particular time slice, which actually contains both gamma of B and gamma of ABC. And I didn't. So you have to show that that exists. Um, uh, but the point here is that gamma of B and gamma of ABC um, don't cross. I mean, I really should have put a picture. So let me. Let me put a tiny little picture here. I hope you guys can, can see this. But um, if this is B, A, and C, um, uh, gamma of B will look like this, and gamma of ABC will look like this, and they don't cross. And so they can, they, they can and they will live on a common slice. And that I'm calling sigma. On that slice, you find yourself um, what the minimal surface on sigma is. Um, so, so you find yourself, you know, you're, it's like you're doing the static proof, but on, on, on this new slice sigma, this, these gamma tildes, um, are, they're not the actual HRT surfaces because they're on the wrong slice. Okay. Um, but on that slice, you certainly have that the area, oh, but because, um, the true extreme, the true HRT surface is obtained by maximizing over the set of slices. 
the actual entry of A and B will, will bound above the area of this um, uh, minimal surface you found on the wrong slice. Okay, then you do the static proof uh, on sigma and you will combine it with these two inequalities and you're all you're you're good to go. Um, so you you this is this inequality you get from the static proof on on the slice and these inequalities you get from the fact that um, you're you're on the wrong slice you're not on the you're not on the maximizing slice in this formula. Okay, so that's that's very beautiful it works very well notice that we need the fact in order to assert the existence of this sigma, we need the fact that gamma of B and gamma of ABC don't cross. That's going to be important soon. Um, you can do the same thing for MMI um, because for MMI on the left-hand side, um, uh, so on the left-hand side, you again have a bunch of things that don't cross. So let me let me actually just Just right. Um, uh, so on the left, so MMI is like this, and none of these things cross. And so again, you can find a single slice that contains every term on the left-hand side of, um, of of the inequality. Okay. Um, However, if you go and look at the higher entropy inequalities, um, starting with the five-party dihedral inequality, what's our left-hand side here? Well, it's got you know, A, B, and B, C. Well, guess what? Those cross. So they do not, the, the, the HRT surfaces for A, B, and B, C do not in general lie on the same slice. So there's no slice that I can use uh, to, to play this game here that I did for SSA or for MMI, okay? So, um, uh, so this proof strategy, which got us farther, is not working for the higher entropy cone inequalities, the higher entropy inequalities. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about in the in the rest of the talk, um, I have ten minutes, right? Okay. Um, uh, is um, uh, a different proof strategy. Uh, which we think gets around this. And this is, as I said, this is work in progress with Guillermo Grimaldi and Veronica Hubini. So we have not, you know, I'm giving you guys a bit of a sneak preview. We have not crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's on this. So it's possible that we've missed something and that we're going to fall on our faces. But I'm, you know, I'd say like at the 95% confidence level, I think this is probably going to work. Um, and the strategy is different. Um, Although obviously inspired by by Maximin, because we're simply going to be super clever and replace Maximin by Minimax. Okay, um, so instead of varying um, uh, first uh, against um, uh, variations uh, in the space direction and then the time direction, we're just going to swap the order. Okay. Oh, oh, oh I forgot something. Um, so people have asked this question about whether they, they're obeyed. Um, uh, um, so there have been a, a couple of papers numerically investigating it and finding that they, that they seem to be obeyed in, in examples. And then Bartek and Shidong showed that um, they're obeyed um, in uh, two plus one dimensional bulk um, uh, in a very clever way that used the fact that the HRT surfaces are always you know geodesics and and so you can actually write any such inequality as a positive linear combination of SSAs, um, but it's like a case by case thing where each arrangement you know has a different lit so it's not as I said before it's this inequality is independent of SSA it does not follow from SSA but for a given arrangement of intervals in you know. Um, uh, for a, um, a one plus one dimensional boundary, it can be decomposed into a linear com positive linear combination of SSAs. Okay, we, we, we take a different approach. So we, we do minimax. Um, uh, and here, you know, you're, you're gonna see my drawing ability is not totally up to the job. This is kind of the best I could do. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so minimax means you look at time sheets. So a timesheet is a time-like hypersurface. Um, 
And within a timesheet, you look at a maximal area surface. So the surface is co-dimension two in the space time, um, which makes it co-dimension one within the hype within the time-like hypersurface, which I'll call a timesheet. And so the timesheet has an induced metric on it, which is Lorentzian. And then you're basically finding what you would have called a maximal volume um, slice within that timesheet, but we're going to call it a maximal area surface. Um, and that protects you against possible variations in, in your area um, uh, for wiggling your, your, your surface up and down in the time direction. And then you, then you minimize uh, moving in the spatial directions. Okay, so here I have my, my, my HRT surface and it's sitting inside this timesheet tau. Um, and, um, and somewhere along the line, we need to impose the homology condition. And the way we impose the homology condition is not by working on a given slice in the bulk, but rather um, uh, by, uh, by looking at space-time regions. So what I wanna say is that my timesheet is homologous via a bulk space-time region to a boundary region, which I'll call R of A, a boundary space-time region. So I have, a, so, so but up until now, all of my homology relations that I've been talking about have been spatial. So it's been, you know, a given spatial surface is homologous to another given spatial surface on a time slice. Now I'm talking about a space-time homology region where I have a, um, a, a, a time-like hypersurface being homologous to another time-like hypersurface. In this case, the time-like hypersurface, the second one is R of A, um, which uh, has to be such that it's, its intersection with the, the slice we were talking about is equal to A. Okay, so we have this condition that R of A intersects with the uh, given boundary slice precisely on A. And that's, that's the homology condition. That's what enforces the homology condition. And then again, you have to go and you have to show that this, this formula is equivalent to HRT and so on. So that part I'm putting aside, but I hope I've you know, I hope it at least seems reasonable from a pictorial point of view that it, it, it that it might that it has a chance of being. Okay, so this kind of rearranges the proof um, in a way that's that makes it more flexible. Okay, um, but we need one other sort of technical um, thing before we make progress. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these time sheets and just like we did for the surfaces, we're going to use them to cut each other up. Okay, so so here is my I have my, I, I've, I've left out the soup can in this figure. So I have my boundary region A, B, and C. Um, and, um, uh, and here I have my A, B time slice. Uh, and here I have my B, C time slice. And they intersect each other. So they, each one divides the other into two partial time slices. So now I have four partial time slices, okay, which I call tau one of A, B, uh, tau two of, Sorry, tau two of AB, tau one of BC, and tau two of BC. Okay, and the point is that just like in a static proof where I glued together the partial minimal surfaces, I'm going to glue together these these partial time slices, uh, time sheets. So I'm going to glue together this one with this one to make something which is homologous to B, and I'm going to glue this one to this one to make make something which is homologous to ABC. Okay, when I do that, I'm also cutting the surfaces. So inside of this slice, there's the minimal surface, the extremal surface gamma of AB, the purple thing. And within this time sheet, there's the extremal surface gamma of BC, the red thing. And those are also getting cut into. Okay, so now we actually have four partial surfaces, each one lying on one of four partial time sheets. Okay, the, um, the engine that makes this proof go is the following lemma, which is that the Okay, let, let me first say that, you know, that the, the HRT surface is generically unique, but, but you have a lot of freedom in choosing your timesheet that it lives on. Um, and you can use that freedom to get the following fact that the partial surfaces are maximal surfaces on their partial timesheets. So we know that we know that this surface, gamma of BC, is maximal on this timesheet. But we don't know a priori that this partial surface is maximal on this partial timesheet. So the, the lemma asserts that you can choose the timesheets in such a way that that is the case. 
And now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna try to glue these things together. But you see immediately there's something funny because as I, as I said before, this partial surface, if I wanna glue this partial surface to this partial surface to make a surface for B, well, I can't because they don't even meet up. But the thing is that that's okay because that's actually gonna give us an inequality in the direction we want, okay? Okay, so, um, uh, so what I do is I take, um, uh, I mean, this, it, it's getting a little bit technical and I don't know how, how well people are, are able to follow, but hopefully they can at least get the spirit of the thing. Um, uh, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna glue together these timesheets to make a timesheet for B, which is not smooth. And within that, I'm gonna find some maximal surface. That's gonna be my gamma tilde of B. And it's not the same as what I get by gluing this thing to this thing because that doesn't even make a surface. Okay, so it's not true that this gamma tilde of B is equal to the union of the two um, partial surfaces. Okay. Um, but what is true is that I have an inequality on their areas because this, this the union of these surfaces is maximal under a weaker condition. This one is maximal under the condition that I have a surface that, that makes a full legit surface. This one is maximal under a weaker condition because I don't demand that gamma one of AB and gamma one of BC join up to make a full legit surface. Since I've maximized under a weaker constraint, I've maximized the same quantity, namely the area under a weaker constraint. I know that um, uh, this one is gonna be less than or equal to this one. Okay, and now I have all my pieces because of course my time sheet, this one is maximal on the wrong time sheet. So it also bounds the true, um, the area of the true HRT surface for B. So if you look at that from above, um, uh, S of B is given by the area of the true HRT surface. Here I have this, this fake HRT surface, which lives um, here, it's in red, uh, which lives on the wrong timesheet. Remember, I'm minimizing over the timesheet. So the true thing is gonna be smaller than the fake one. And similarly, S of ABC is less than or equal to this, you know, gamma tilde of ABC. I combine that with what I had before, and I get these inequalities. You add these inequalities, and you're all set. Okay, so um, uh, this that gives you the proof of SSA. Um, you may or may not be that interested in in another proof of something we already knew to be true. I mean, I think it's it's always nice to have a new proof. Um, uh, but what I think is maybe even a little bit more interesting is that if you think about this proof method for a while, you realize that nowhere did I care about this crossing issue. So this proof actually in some ways hues a little bit closer to the static proof. It didn't need to identify a slice on which every term on the left-hand side lived. Um, and therefore it generalizes in exactly the same way as the static proofs to the higher inequalities, okay? Um, and that is, um, I'm exactly on time, it's 3.15 on the East Coast. So um, uh, that is the punchline of this talk. Um, and I'll just say one other thing as an advertisement that um, this, this Minimax thing is um, uh, partly came out of, um, another piece of work that Veronica and I are, are, are doing together on uh, covariantizing bit threads, which gave us a list of actually almost a dozen new formulas uh, that are equivalent to HRT. And this is just one of them, but the others basically, most of them involve some sort of bit threads. And this is the one that seems to have been most useful for proving entropy inequalities. But I just wanted to advertise that um, because I couldn't let it go that there was some, something, about, something more to say about bit threads. So anyway, that's um, that's the end of my talk, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Um, so, so first, I'll ask if there are um, uh, questions people are willing to ask and have recorded for posterity. Oliver. Yeah, I, I was just sort of going to follow up on what Matt was saying at the end. So, what you and Veronica did, I was wondering about maximin versus minimax, and whether they were all ultimately proved to be equivalent or sort of it's a new assumption that they are all equivalent to HRT. Um, and it sounded like you were saying at the end that actually you've 
you've proven that they're all equivalent, but I wanted to check on that. Right, right. I mean, you know, within our standards of rigor, um, we, we, we've, we've satisfied ourselves that we've proven that they're, they're equivalent to, to HRT. Um, yeah. And it's not anything, I mean, you can, it's not like a 10 page proof. It's like all, we're just putting together very well-known standard facts about extremal surfaces, light rays and stuff like that. And the, you know, once you put together everything that's already known about how, you know, extremal surfaces and light rays behave in, in, in space times with ADS boundary conditions, obeying the null energy condition, it, it just falls right out. There's nothing, you know, particularly clever in that or, no, or novel in that aspect of it. So you're free to look at our proof and decide whether you, you know, you agree with it or not. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for the Matt in the world? Actually, Matt, can, can I ask about this, this proof? Um, hmm. Time sheets. So yeah. it, first, first for the homology condition, you don't seem to care about the domain of dependence of it. You only care about the fact that this this time sheet pulls back to some time-like surface which intersects with A on the boundary. Right. Um, and the and as, as you said, the, the, the key key point seems to be that minimization happens at the end. That, that, that's what yeah. sort of gets, gets the RP proof yeah. going. Yeah. Now, in, in the proof given for the holographic entropy inequalities, the, as you mentioned at the very beginning, the, the, the proof went through mint cards on graphs. Yes. It, it, didn't, it didn't really use the, the proof strategy that has been used in, in uh, earlier proofs of... Uh, um, well, I mean, it can be, all of those things can be reduced to graphs. You right. know, you, 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 just to make, for those who, you know, um, maybe haven't been thinking about this already, the relation between the manifold and the graph is that you, you can take your manifold, I'm just talking about the static case, and you can, you can cut it up along all minimal surfaces. I mean, all minimal surfaces for all the re boundary regions and all combinations of boundary regions. And then, and then you get a vertex for each, that, that sort of decomposes the, your bulk into cells. And you, you know, each cell is a, is a vertex in the graph. And then you get an edge for each piece of a minimal surface. And you assign that a capacity, which is the area of that um, piece of the minimal surface. And then any, anything, you've sort of reduced the problem of finding um, you know, RT entropies to you know, min cuts on the graph. To a combinatorial thing. So anyway, I just that was to fill people in. But what what what, what was your question, Mukund? Yeah. So so the question was going to be: Is there an analog statement for graph theoretic statement for for this proof? Right. Right. Um, uh, so you can again, I think to some extent. Um, so if you have a whole bunch of boundary regions and you see that the bulk here got, you know, got, got cut up. So this, this thing you could think of already as a graph with mm -hmm. like four vertices, you know, A, B, C, and the purifier. And, you know, they all have some, um, uh, some, some edges connecting them. Each, each edge represents a partial time sleep. Time sheet, the, the subtlety is that the, um, uh, is what capacities you you assign to the edges or what weights you assign to the edges. But I think if you assign to the edges the maximal area on the partial time sheet, um, mm -hmm. then uh, it will it will work out. The only thing that's if you then take that graph and and figure out the min cut on it, it will not be the HRT entropy. Yes. So, so there's another step there. there it, it, this graph does not contain all the information, unlike in the static case, the graph does not contain all the information of all the entropies. So you mm -hmm. cannot read the entropy vector off from this graph. And in fact, I don't think there is a graph, you know, a simple assignment of, uh, of edge weights, you know, with that property. Right. But it, it's a, that's a very interesting question. Good, thanks. Um, any further public questions?
Okay. If not, I'll stop the recording here. People can feel free to ask further questions. The real and questions. Real questions. And then, of course, uh, we have a half an hour to stretch out, talk, uh, get a cup of tea, and then uh, Graham will start at 345.